गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ रेडिएशन ऑनकोलॉजी आर सी सी जितनर आई वुड लाइक टू वेलकम वन एंड ऑल टू द फर्स्ट सेशन ऑफ द टारगेट वॉल्यूम डेलीनेशन वेबिनार सीरीज ऑफ ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन सम ऑफ यू हैव बीन विद अस सिंस लास्ट ईयर वी हैव हैड दिस सेट ऑफ वेबिनार्स लास्ट ईयर टू आर स्पीकर फॉर टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस मैरेज ऑफ ओर ऑफ एरिंग्स इज डॉक्टर सैसल टी कैनिकल एडिशनल प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ रेडिएशन ऑनकोलॉजी आर सी सी ट्रिवेंड्रम सर एज डन इज ग्रेजुएशन फ्रॉम कोटा मेडिकल कॉलेज His specialty training in radiation oncology from Government Medical College, Trivandrum, and has cleared his MRCP since. Sir has been a faculty in RCC Trivandrum since more than a decade and a half. He is an expert in head and neck oncology. He has authored multiple research papers, many chapters in textbooks and manuals of oncology, and is leading in radiation oncology journals. And is also involved in a number of ongoing research projects and clinical trials at national and international level. He was also a member of the ICMR subcommittee for the formulation of guidelines for the management of laryngeal and hypopharyngeal cancers, and has served as a member of the scientific committee of Arroy. Dr. Kanekal is an extremely familiar voice among the radiation oncology residents, having been associated with various online teaching forums like Chart Rounds India and having conducted innumerable online webinars. It is my honor to invite Dr. Kanekal to give the next lecture on uh, clinical approach and imaging in oropharyngeal carcinomas. Uh, sir, you may take over the session. thank you very much for the kind introduction um, i congratulate the uh, rcc jipma team for the uh, organizing this meeting and also for uh, the kind invitation uh, can you uh, you can hear me right can you hear me yes sir you are audible yeah yeah, yeah. so i will share my slides okay so uh, today i will discuss about the uh, initial part of the uh, carcinoma oropharynx and uh, tomorrow i will discuss about the management and the contouring part so uh, just give me one minute so can you uh, see my slides yes sir your slides are visible yeah yeah so so the this will be the flow of the lecture today first i will discuss about the approach to the carcinoma oropharynx then the investigations to be done the radiological anatomy and the staging so tomorrow i will discuss the uh, the treatment as well as the contouring guidelines uh the coming to the approach we know that the carcinoma oropharynx the oropharynx lies behind the oral cavity and below the nasopharynx and above the hypopharynx so the uh, first we will discuss about the uh, the uh, the location so this is the oropharynx so The, this is the oral cavity, the anterior two third of the tongue, and you have the circumvallate papilla. So that is the posterior one third of the tongue. So this is the posterior one third, which is posterior to the circumvallate papilla. So that will be the posterior one third of the tongue. That is one subside. The other subside is the tonsillar fossa. So you have the anterior tonsillar pillar. Anterior tonsillar pillar is nothing but a mucosal covering over the palatal glossus muscle. the palatal glossus arises from the palatine aponeurosis of the soft palate and it is inserted into the the extrinsic into the tongue so it is an extrinsic muscle of the tongue so that is the anterior tonsillar pillar then you have the tonsil you have the posterior tonsillar pillar the posterior tonsillar pillar is nothing but the palato pharyngeus muscle the palato pharyngeus muscle again arises from the palatine aponeurosis and it is inserted downwards that i will discuss later then uh, then i have we have the soft palate so you have the soft palate and you have the uvula so uh, posterior to the hard palate you have the soft palate and uh, the below the base of tongue you have the palatine so this is uh, also part of the oropharynx and the posterior pharyngeal wall in this the in the oropharyngeal area this is also considered as part of the uh, oropharyngeal oropharynx so you have the posterior one third of the tongue and the tonsillar pillar tonsillar fossa posterior tonsillar pillar soft palate then uh, you have the valvula And the posterior pharyngeal wall. So this is the uh, this constitute the oropharynx. So you are seeing a uh, daily cases uh, uh, in oropharynx in your clinic. So so you have a lesion. This is you can see a lesion in the tonsillar fossa involving the anterior tonsillar pillar and also extending anterior to tonsil. The arm to maybe arm to is involved. So in this particular patient, you need to have a proper clinical examination. The first important thing is. the proper clinical examination extent of the disease and whether the tonsillar lingual sulcus is involved the posterior one third is involved you have to palpate properly then whether the the uh, anterior two third of the tongue is involved 
and also whether the floor of mouth is involved. The, this, and superiorly whether soft palate is involved and patient is having any RMT involvement. And these are all uh, really matters. Now, clinical examination is the first and foremost step. And suppose in this patient, so you have a lesion in the soft palate, whether what about the medial extent, whether it is coming to the midline, what about the tonsil is involved, and then hard palate is involved. So, and these are all important. So for three things, one, to stage the disease. Number two, for you to, you have to correlate this with the radiology because whether your clinical examination is correlating because this mucosal involvement may not be seen in their CT or MR. But when you can't do, the third aspect is when you can't do, when you're doing an IMRT, when you do a target only delineation, and this may not be seen in your CT or MR, but you have to see that from the clinical examination. So this is extending some the mucosal extension there. And whether this coming to the crossing to the midline, this is important for delineating the nodes on the opposite side. So proper clinical examination is like a foundation for uh, approaching a oropharyngeal carcinoma. Now, how to, what are the workup? One, the proper clinical examination. So that we have already, then coming to the workup, then you have to do a biopsy and you have to do a P60 nursing because the, the, P, the HPV positive C oropharynx is a new disease entity now. You have to do a P60 nursing. Some, some people may ask me, is it mandatory to do a P60 nursing if you clinically do not uh, feel that it is a HPV positive disease? Okay, I agree to them. Because uh, uh, the, uh, although the prognosis and staging is different and the treatment is, it remains the same. So other is you have to do an X-ray chest, imaging uh, CT or MR, then baseline investigations in advanced disease, you need to do a creatine clearance test also, dental evaluation. And uh, in patients who have lower cervical nodes, you have to do a CT thorax or you do a PET-C. And uh, these are optional in investigations, CT thorax or PET-C. We cannot clearly say that they are mandatory. Now, coming to the disease, a carcinoma of the oropharynx, this is mostly the squamous and carcinomas, and the uh, minus salivary gland tumors can also arise, but most of them are squamous and carcinomas. It may be HPV positive or HPV negative. HPV positive tumors are more undifferentiated tumors with base load features. And the diff there is a different prognosis. HPV positive disease have a good prognosis, and whereas the patients with HPV negative have a poor outcome. There's a separate staging because in 2018, ADCC, it has become incorporated as a different separate disease entity. Although the prognosis and staging are different, as of now, we do not have any concrete data to say that the HPV positive disease should be treated in a different way. So this is the outline. Now coming to the HPV positive, I will just brush up on the, the P16 assay, then which all investigations to be done. Why it has become a different disease entity, I'm not going into details, but this was a paper which published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2010. And this was a subset analysis of the RTOG0129 clinical trial. The RTOG0129 clinical trial was a phase three randomized trial comparing the concurrent chemo radiation with conventional radiotherapy basis axillary radiotherapy. So 70 gray in 35 fractions radiotherapy over a span of seven weeks were randomized to same radiotherapy schedule in six weeks. Plus both arms received the same dose of cisplatin, 100 milligram per meter square given once in three weeks. The data was published in GCO in 2014 with a median follow-up of 7.9 years, showed that there is no difference between the outcomes. And they have done a subset analysis of patients where those who have P16 assay, that is around 260 patients, and they have done a recursive partition analysis to uh, uh, sorry to categorize them into three groups. One is the low risk, other is the intermediate risk and high risk patients. The low risk patients were the P16 positive patients. Those patients who had a less than 10 pack years history of smoking and patients who have a lower up to end to weight. So P16 positive patients and up to end to weight. This was based on the earlier staging system. And when they evaluated the survival, it was found that the three-year overall survival was 94%. That is for low risk. On the other side, those patients who had a P16 negative disease and patients who had P4 disease at presentation and or the patient who have more than 10 pack years of smoking history and this blue, it constituted high risk and three-year overall survival was 40%. So what does it mean? It means the lowest patients have achieved a plateau like 
early Hodgkin's disease or jam cell tumor with a very good prognosis, like three year overall survival of 94%. So if, you, if we have this good prognosis, then why don't we reduce the treatment? Because then you to avoid the radiotherapy or the chemotherapy induced long-term toxicities. That is our concern. So low risk can be de-intensify our treatment. In high risk, there is a huge room for improvement because the overall survival is only 42%. Can we intensify our treatment? And the, the people, the patients which were not included either into the low risk or the intermediate risk were considered as uh, low risk or high risk, they're considered as intermediate risk. And they have say five years or three years survival is 67, which is something in which they now coming to the, the clinical pictures there. So we have, I already told you, we have HPV positive disease and HPV negative disease. The HPV positive disease is most of the patients are males, patient middle-aged men, presenting with a uh, predilection site is the oropharynx. The patient present with, generally present with small stage, that is early stage, T1 or a T2 disease with a large node, large cystic node. And this is the characteristic present. And most of the time, we may not be able to find out the, uh, the site so you may, when, when you do, you will evaluate like a metastatic or unknown primary. Then if you do a PET CT, then you will take an uptake there and you take a biopsy, then it will turn to be possible. And most of the histology is a, a basal heart features like poorly differential histology with basal heart features. So this is a, the HPV positive disease. And which all patients should undergo the HPV positive testing? That's the human papillomavirus testing. And uh, two publications, that is one is by the case of pathology, pathological laboratory medicine that published in 2018, the guidelines from the American College of Pathologists, College of American Pathologists. And this was endorsed by the ASCO uh, and also published in GCO in October, 2018. And if you look into, before coming to the investigations, we need to know which are the tests which are available. So this is the HPV infection. So the human papilloma virus infect into the the HPV DNA, and this get incorporated. This is called the second step. First is the HPV infection. Second step is the viral integration. This incorporates into the human, this is into the integration. Then after that, what happens is the viral transcription. So the viral transcription, so at this level, so if you have a viral transcription has occurred, then you can find out the HPV the DNA in situ hybridization can be done, and you can find out the PV. Then once the transaction is done, you know that this is the, you have the, uh, you have the E6 mRNA. From the DNA, the mRNA occurs. So the E6 and E7 mRNA occur. So they, this have a different path. The E6 mRNA, through the viral oncoprotein translation, this, 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 what it causes, it causes a tumor suppression inactivation. That is, it suppresses the P53. And then to the E7, E7 protein, it incorporates and it, after the viral oncoprotein translation, this causes a tumor suppressor inactivation. This is a retinoblastoma gene is inactivated. So the P53 and retinoblastoma are the gene pathway. Both of them are the tumor sub, uh, suppressor genes. So both of them are inactivated. And this lead on to the, uh, the, in, the pathogenesis of the tumor. And uh, in the process from the HPV DNA, the accumulated products of this, that is the P16 is getting accumulated. And we can do evaluation of the P16, or you can do an mRNA. So that is by an R2 uh, RNA institute hybridization. So these are the tests which are available, or you can do a DNA. So which all patients should undergo, this is a very busy slide, but uh, for patients who have a oropharyngeal primary, or patients who have multiple nodes involving level two and level three, level two or level three, you are not able to make out the final. So it's a metastatic node, unknown primary. You do a level two or level three. And patients who have multiple sites of involvement, suppose you cannot make out whether the oropharynx extending into larynx or oral cavity extending into oropharynx. You cannot make out from where the primary site, whether it is a oral cavity extending oropharynx or vice versa. So multiple tumors, uh, tumor uh, involving oro, that is other third indication. So one is oropharyngeal primary, the cervical neck nodes involving level two and level three, then multi-site tumor involving oropharynx. So these are the three indications for doing a uh, P16 assay. Now coming to the uh, the extent of oropharynx. 
so it extends of oropharynx involves the this is the soft palate this is a hard palate and posterior aspect is a soft palate so it extends from the level of the soft palate it to the level of the pallet so it includes the soft palate here the tonsil the posterior one third of the tongue the valicula then uh, you have the, the posterior pharyngeal wall corresponding to the oropharynx so these are the, uh, the subsides of uh, uh, you have the valicula base of tongue and uh, up to this if the if it goes below that this level then it will become a larynx that i will discuss when we discuss the radiological anatomy now coming to the uh, radiological anatomy then this is the level so this is the hard palate this is the soft palate this is a uvula and you have the this is the sphenoid sinus it is not area of our interest so this is the nasopharynx okay from here to this is from from the blue line this between these two blue lines so it slices inferior to the nasopharynx superior to the hypopharynx and posterior to the oral cavity so this is a oropharynx so this is a soft palate you have the base of tongue here you have the valicula you have the uh, you have the valicula and this is the epiglottis you have the epiglottis here and the, up to the lingual surface of the epiglottis it is the oropharynx so it is the if you have the this is actually it is part it this is extending into it becomes t3 so this is a valicula and below that this is a pre epiglottic space and it is involved then it becomes a involving the oropharynx extending into the larynx and uh, we look into the mri this is a soft uh, can you see my mouse moving okay where pointer is moving is it clear to you hello yes okay thank you so this is a soft palate uh, this is a soft palate so this is in mri this is a base of tongue you get this is the lingual tonsil that is why uh, there is an enhancement this is the you see the the lingual surface of the epiglottis here the base of tongue you can see the extrinsic muscles of the tongue very clearly like this is the genioglossus muscle that i will discuss when we discuss uh, the base of tongue and spread okay now coming to the um, the next slide now we are we are going into the different sites as such so we will discuss tonsil soft palate uh, everything in detail so this is the palatine tonsil and it is anteriorly it is the palatoglossal fold or the palatoglossal arch is nothing but the palatoglossus muscle there. and uh, this is radiologically considered as the uh, this is considered as the posterior limit of the oral tongue or the anterior limit of the oropharynx because you cannot make out the circumvallate papilla in the ct or mr and posteriorly it is the palatopharyngeus fold which is formed by the palatopharyngeus muscle and superiorly you have the superiorly it is a site where both the palatoglossal and the palatoglossal arch and the palatopharyngeal arch meet so this is the superior level so in the inferiorly it is formed by the dorsal surface of the posterior one third of the tongue so this is the dorsal surface this is the posterior one third of the tongue the dorsal surface of the posterior one third of the tongue laterally you know that it is the lateral wall of the oropharynx so that is the uh, the uh, the, uh, the tonsil now how the tonsil are carcinoma spread okay so this is the palatine tonsil this is the anterior tonsil pillar this is the posterior tonsil pillar so it can spread into the anterior tonsil pillar posterior tonsil pillar okay suppose a tumor in the tonsil fossa when it spreads laterally it can pierce it can infiltrate the superior constrictor muscle this is the superior constrictor muscle okay this is the superior constrictor muscle it can spread superior constrictor muscle and it can spread into the, there is a structure called pterygomandibular raphe and that i will discuss and from the due through the pterygomandibular raphe it can spread into the mandible it can spread into the buccinator muscle and once the the the, uh, the superior constrictor muscle is involved it can spread along the pterygomandibular raphe that i will discuss how it spread then posteriorly it can spread into the uh, the parapharyngeal space posteriorly into the carotid sheath this is the carotid sheath laterally it can spread into the medial pterygoid muscle this is a medial pterygoid muscle which is inserted into the ramus and the angle of the mandible in the inner aspect so this is the insertion of the medial pterygoid muscle and you have the you can spread into the the, the mandible 
can spread laterally into the mandible also. Posteriorly, it can spread to the prevertebral muscles. It can spread to the prevertebral muscle, it can spread into the carotid shape. Superiorly, it can spread through the palatal glosis. It can spread into the soft palate. And this can spread through the anterior tonsillar pillar and the posterior tonsillar pillar because these are muscles arising from the palatine aponeurosis. It can spread superiorly into the soft palate. That is the spread. Inferiorly, it can spread into the what? It can spread into the posterior one third of the tongue through the anterior tonsillar pillar, nothing but the palatal process. And from the pterygomandibular wrap, it can spread also into the retromolar trigon. Retromolar trigon, this mucosa, this is this is nothing but the pterygomandibular wrap, which is covering the, the retromolar trigon. So this is a uh, figure showing the oropharynx. So we will discuss the, oh, the soft palate later. This is what we are discussing now. This is the palatine tonsil. It is anteriorly the palatal glossus muscle, which arises from the palatine aponeurosis, which is inserted into the tongue. Tongue. So there is an extrinsic muscle of the tongue. And posteriorly, it is from the, the palatopharyngeus muscle. The palatopharyngeus muscle again arises from the palatine aponeurosis. And posteriorly, it extends into the posterior, uh, posterior part of the thyroid cartilage that I will discuss later. Now, coming to the palatoglossus muscle, this is the palatoglossus muscle, which is nothing but the anterior tonsillar pillar arises from the palatine aponeurosis. It is getting inserted into the lateral aspect of the tongue. Whereas the palatopharyngeus, it is arises from the palatine aponeurosis. It is inserted into the posterior aspect of the posterior and the lateral aspect of the, the thyroid cartilage. This is the insertion of the palatopharyngeus. So, when you have a, you have a tumor, in the posterior tonsillar pillar, the lesion can even go up to the thyroid cartilage through the palatopharyngeus muscle. That is why we need to learn all this anatomy. And this is the palato. Uh, I will just give an introduction. This is the, the palatine aponeurosis, which gives, uh, which is another muscles which are inserted are the tensor valle palate muscle and levator valle palate muscle are there. That I will discuss when we discuss the uh, soft palate. Now coming to the CT scan and MRI of the tonsil. So this is the posterior aspect of the heart palate. We have this soft palate here. Okay, this is nothing but the superior constrictor muscle. The superior constrictor muscle, you have the anterior tonsillar pillar here, the tonsillar fossa, the posterior tonsillar pillar, and you have the posterior pharyngeal wall. So these are the structures. Here you have the parapharyngeal space. This you have the medial pterygoid muscle. This is the medial pterygoid muscle. You come across the lateral pterygoid muscle a little higher. This is a medial pterygoid muscle. This is the longest capitis muscle and longest collar muscle in the prevertebral muscle. This are, and certain other muscles are here. That is the stylohyoid muscle is there. Then the patient is uh, styloglosis, stylopharynges. The muscles arise in the styloid process. You cannot make out that in a CT. Now coming to the uh, MRI. So we have discussed the CT part. Now we are coming to the MRI. So this is the palatine tons. This is the, how you look in the palatine tons. This is nothing but the palatal glossal arch. That is the anterior tonsillar pillar. You have the posterior tonsillar pillar. So this is the, you have the posterior tonsillar pillar. That is called the posterior. This is the posterior uh, uh, tonsillar pillar. Now you have, the, this is a superior constrictor muscle. This is a superior constrictor muscle. You have the longest catheter muscle here. You have the carotid sheath here. Uh, posterior belly of the digastric. The posterior belly of the digastric forms the anterior border and the lateral border of the level two lymph node. So these these nodes are coming in this. This is the, this forms the lateral border of the level two lymph nodes and also the anterior border. And this is the posterior belly of the digastric. And there are certain muscles are there: stylohyoid, styloglosis, stylopharyngeus muscle. I'm not going into the details. This is the soft palate. You have the uvula here. And uh, this is at the level of the C2 vertebra. Now coming to the, uh, the root of spread. So you have the palatine tonsil here. I have already told you superior it can spread to the soft palate and inferiorly it can spread into the, it can spread and through the palatopharyngeus muscle to the thyroid cartilage that I, we have discussed. And inferiorly two important things. One is the posterior one third of the tongue. And from there it can go into the floor of mouth and also into anterior tutor of the back. And the clinical examination is very important. Otherwise, you will miss the anterior external tumor. Okay, 
sometimes very subtle changes may not be even picked up in a imaging in this situation your clinical examination becomes very important and when the tumor spreads posteriorly as i've told you it can lead on to the carotid sheath laterally it can spread into the parapharyngeal space medial pterygoid muscle then into the mandible anteriorly and laterally it can spread into the through the pterygomandibular wrapper it can spread into the mandible retromolar trigon and that is anterior and lateral then uh, this is how uh, it spread posteriorly it can spread to the posterior pharyngeal wall also now i have been discussing about pterygomandibular raphe and the superior constrict muscle i will discuss that in detail within a minute now coming to the staging up to t3 it is the size criteria oral cavity oropharynx and hypopharynx follow the size criteria up to t3 okay certain exceptions are there in less than 2 Two to four and more than four centimeters. Up to T three, even in is HPV positive, HPV negative. Now, when the patient is having involvement of the carotid sheath, it becomes T four B. T four B can be due to carotid sheath involvement. It can be due to the lateral wall of nasopharynx, pterygoid plate involvement, and lateral pterygoid muscle. That I will discuss when we discuss the soft palate in detail because that occurs superior. Now the T four A, it can spread into this is the this is medial pterygoid muscle and the medial pterygoid muscle involvement, the mandible involvement, and this becomes T four A. Okay, so and if the patient is having say from the tonsil, it spreads into the base of tongue, and from the base of tongue it spreads into the uh, suppose it extends into the extrinsic muscles of the tongue, then it becomes T four A. So you need to understand the, how the lateral spread. There are two fascia, that is the pharyngeo basilar fascia and the buccopharyngeal fascia. And there is a, uh, there is a, uh, this is the buccopharyngeal fascia, and you have the pharyngeo basilar fascia. And uh, this is same, uh, is um, uh, same given in this picture also. Superior constrictor muscle, because why you need to know superior constrictor muscle? Because the tonsillar lesion infiltrates the superior constrictor muscle, and then it can gain access to the parapharyngeal space medial pterygoid muscle and pterygomandibular wrapper. Then that I have discussed. And how it originates, it becomes the medial pterygoid plate. It arises from the medial pterygoid plate. The pterygoid, medial pterygoid plate and lateral pterygoid plate is there. The muscles arising from the medial pterygoid plate, one is superior constrictor muscle. Then I will discuss one more muscle that I will discuss later. The one is superior, to, uh, this one, superior constrictor muscle. Then from the pterygomandibular wrapper, I will show you pterygomandibular wrapper that arises from the pterygoid hamulus to the mandible. Then this is a superior constrictor muscle, pterygomandibular wrap is this one. Then the alveolar process of the mandible and also part of the tongue. This is the origin of the superior constrictor muscle. It is a muscle arising superiorly from the medial pterygoid plate down to the level of the tongue. Okay, in this area, thus the, the I will show, then the insertion is inserted to the pharyngeal tubercle and also the median wrap. So this is the insertion, median wrap. So this is a median raphe. So this is a median raphe, and this is the superior constrictor muscle origin and insertion. Now we need to know pterygomandibular raphe. Please be with me because this is very important to know the spread of the tonsillar carcinoma. The pterygomandibular raphe arises from the pterygoid hamulus. Pterygoid hamulus is the inferior most part of the medial pterygoid and medial pterygoid plate. Okay. Then from the pterygoid hamulus, there is a there is a pterygomandibular raphe. This arises into the posterior belly, posterior end of the mylohyoid line. So this inserted into the mylohyoid line in the mandible that I will show you. And the, this is the uh, pterygomandibular raphe, and this is the superior constrictor muscle. So superior constrictor muscle arises partially from the medial pterygoid plate, I will tell you, and also from the pterygomandibular raphe, and also from the mandible and part arises from the tongue. So this is very important. Once the pterygoma, this superior constrictor muscle is pierced, this is the tonsillar lesion is involved, infiltrated, it can gain access to the pterygomandibular raphe. And then it can go superiorly to the, superiorly to, superiorly, it can involve the buccinator muscle, it can involve the mandible. Okay, so that is the spread of the tonsillar lesion. 
Why it is important? This is the area from where you have the pterygomandibular pathway is inserted. This is posterior to the mylohyoid line. This is a mylohyoid muscle in the mandible is arising. And posterior to the mylohyoid line, this is the, the this is the pterygomandibular pathway. It arises superiorly from the pterygoid hamulus to the posterior part of the mylohyoid line in the mandible. So now coming to the CT scan, well, I will discuss one of the CT scans. This is involving the lateral pharyngeal wall and also involve the posterior pharyngeal wall. The lesion is involving the posterior one third of the tongue as well. So the lesion is involving the posterior one third of the tongue, lateral uh, tonsillar fossa, anterior tonsillar pillar, posterior tonsillar area, and also involving the, the posterior pharyngeal wall. Same is here also. And lesion is crossing to the opposite side, just crossing to the opposite side. This is also important for delineating the nodal only on the opposite side. Patient is having two nodes, you can make out the level two lymph nodes, you can make out. And this is the node. And the prevertebral muscle involvement in oropharynx is not included in the staging. The prevertebral muscle involvement in nasopharynx is T2 disease. In larynx and hypopharynx, it is T4. Whereas in oropharynx, involvement of the prevertebral muscle is not included in the state. And this is an MRI scan. You can make out the lesion just affecting the posterior one third of the tongue, involving the left tonsillar fossa. Also, you can make out, but you can you cannot clearly make out the plane with the carotid shape. This is a this plane is ill-defined. And also the patient is having a retropharyngeal lump node. Can you see that? This is a retropharyngeal node with a left level to lymphadenopathy. So this is a lesion in the tonsil. Certain situations, in certain situations, sometimes uh, 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 you cannot, uh, the patient may have a very advanced disease. You have a very advanced disease. It is very difficult to make out the site of the disease. So this is involving the uh, left tonsillar fossa, involving the anterior is extrinsic muscles of the tongue. You can make out the extrinsic muscles and tongue is involved. The mylohyoid this muscle is involved. Then posterior pharyngeal wall is involved. The lesion is involving the pterygomandibular pathway. The mandible is involved. The medial pterygoid muscle is involved. Vaccinator is involved. Very advanced disease. In such situations, you should have a proper clinical examination. And like the checklist, you should have a checklist. Like the lesion is extending into the retromolar trigon and anterior two thirds of the tongue medial pterygoid muscle, whether the mandible is involved, what about the vaccinator muscle, the carotid sheath, the carotid sheath, the plane is, there is no plane with the carotid sheath also. It's a T4B disease. And what about the posterior pharyngeal wall? Now, we need to know, we have been discussing about the medial pterygoid, lateral pterygoid. So I will just discuss what is the origin and insertion of the medial, medial and lateral pterygoid muscle because it is very important for uh, uh, the involvement and also for the staging because the medial pterygoid involvement it is T4A, lateral pterygoid involvement it is T4B. So coming to the uh, the lateral pterygoid, you can see you have the you have a lateral pterygoid, you have an upper head and also a lower head. This is a lateral pterygoid. Lateral pterygoid must be more or less travel more or less horizontally and it have a upper head and a lower head. And the upper head this is upper head, and the, this is arising from the infratemporal surface of the great wing of the spinoid. And whereas the lower head arises from the lateral pterygoid plate. So this is the lateral surface of the pterygoid plate. The, uh, please listen to me. The medial pterygoid muscle and the lateral pterygoid muscle both arises from the lateral pterygoid plate, not from the medial. The medial pterygoid is not arising from the medial pterygoid plate. The medial pterygoid plate is also arising in the lateral pterygoid plate that I will tell you later. The lateral pterygoid muscle is, is arising from the lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid plate. And it is inserted here. It is inserted into the, this is the two processes are there. This is the contalar process of the mandible and this is the coronoid process of the mandible. The inner surface of the, it is inserted into the inner surface of the condylar process of the mandible. So this is inserted here. It is in inner surface of the condylar process of the mandible. So this is the origin and insertion of the lateral pterygoid muscle. Once the lateral pterygoid muscle is involved, it becomes T4B. Pterygoid plate destruction is also T4B. 
whereas in the medial pterygoid involvement medial pterygoid involvement it have a it have a deep head and it has superficial head it have a deep head and a superficial head so this is the medial pterygoid muscle so it have a superficial head and a deep head and the superficial head arises from the maxillary tuberosity and the deep head arises from the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plane that is inserted it is it is it is uh, uh, it is getting inserted downwards and laterally to the inner aspect of the ramus of the mandible and also and the angle. So this is the inner aspect of the ramus and the angle of the mandible. That is the insertion of the medial pterygoid muscle. Then how you will see that in the CT scan. So in the CT scan, this is the pterygoid plate. Okay, from the lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid plate, lateral pterygoid muscle arises and getting inserted into the condylar process okay and you have the medial pterygoid muscle which arises from the lateral medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate it is inserted into the mandible in the inner aspect in the angle of the mandible okay that we this is at a higher cut that's why we are not able to see the insertion of the medial pterygoid muscle and here this is a one muscle that is called the temporalis temporalis muscle arises from the temporal fossa inserted into the coronoid process of the mandible that is a, that is a, into the this is a, this is not important in oropharynx but when we discuss the oral cavity it is important so this is the temporalis inserted into the superior and the inner aspect of the the coronoid process of the mandible that is the uh, that is the temporalis and you have two muscles arises from that is uh, the medial to the medial pericord muscle it has the tensor vale palate muscle this uh, it is not clearly seen here this is tensor vale palate muscle and you have another muscle called levator vale palate muscle that i will discuss when i discuss the oropharynx uh, soft palate and certain tonsillar lesions in patients who have uh, patients who have uh, uh, very uh, middle aged man patient person who get hp positive disease you may not be able to make out the primary when you do a pet scan as part of metastatic workup you will see an update then you will do a biopsy like tonsillectomy then you will do a you will be able to find out the disease this is again a lesion this is how a cystic node with a lesion involving base of tongue and also actually it is a base of tongue lesion involving the uh, tonsillar fossa and the tonsillar pillar and tonsillar fossa now coming to the uh, same similar picture in the tonsillar, this is also a HPV positive disease. Large node, small primer. It may not be picked up in a clinical examination. So this is the presentation of an HPV positive disease. Now coming to the second side, that's a soft palate. Okay, so a soft palate. This is a soft palate, and soft palate. It is inserted. It is it is inserted into the. So this is a soft palate, and it is in the posterior aspect of the hard palate. And it is uh, uh, in the posterior margin of the heart palate and the under surface of the heart palate. This is attached, soft palate is attached. The under surface and the posterior aspect of the heart palate is attached. That's a soft palate. And the soft palate has an upper border. It is attached to the posterior margin of the heart palate. And the lower border, that is a free, and it is a conical projection, which is nothing but the tubula. And this is, can be divided into three. That is the anterior one third, middle third, and the posterior one third. The anterior one third is mainly the fibrous, the attachment part. The middle third is the muscular part. Okay, that forms the muscle. So five muscles are there in soft palate. Okay, the posterior one third is the gland part. That is it. Now coming this part we have discussed already. Now we will take up this part. That is this is the soft palate. Okay, and there are two muscles. So two muscles are actually the muscle, five muscles are there. One is the palatoglossus, palatopharyngeus. This is the muscular uvula, and you have the levator vale palatal muscle and tensor vale palatal. Levator vale palatal muscle and tensor vale palatal muscle are inserted here, whereas the palatoglossus, palatopharyngeus arises from the palatina conorosa. You have the pterygoid hamulus. Okay, this is important when we discuss the pterygoid mandibular ram. And you have the two muscles. The tensor vale palate muscle is more lateral. The vetro vale palate muscle is more medial. I will discuss these two muscles in little detail. 
when we discuss about the tensor valve palatine this is the tensor valve palatine muscle it hooks the pterygoid hamlets and getting inserted into the palatine ponderosus and what is the origin it arises this is the spine of spine of the sphenoid process so it arises from the spine of the sphenoid process and this is the this is the pterygoid plates the medial pterygoid plate and the lateral pterygoid plate the inferior most portion of the medial pterygoid plate is called the pterygoid hamlet and you have the uh, you have the medial surface and the lateral surface of the uh, medial this so this is a medial pterygoid plate this is the lateral pterygoid and so there is uh, arises you have the you have the scaphoid fossa of the medial pterygoid plate so this is the area from where the tensor valve palatine muscle arises and the one spine to the scaphoid fossa of the medial pterygoid plate the medial pterygoid plate and the medial pterygoid muscle and lateral pterygoid muscle is arising from the lateral pterygoid plate i have told already told you the muscle arises from the medial pterygoid plate from the scaphoid fossa is the tensor valve palatine muscle and the why you need to know all this because this get it can go the tumor in the soft palate go up and it is it can go up to the level of the nasopharynx that is why we need to know the origin and insertion of tensor valve palatine muscle now the inserted into and also another origin this is the uh, this is the auditory tube and the lateral part of the auditory tube that is the lateral fibrous lamina of the auditory tube these are three origin one is the spine of the sphenoid process the scaphoid fossa of the medial pterygoid plate and also the lateral fibrous lamina of the auditory tube this is the origin and it hook around the pterygoid hamlet and get inserted in the palatine aponeurosis that is tensor valve palatine now coming to the levator valve palatine muscle levator valve palatine muscle arises from the under surface of the apex of the petrous temporal bone this is the under surface of the apex of the petrous temporal bone and second is from the carotid sheath okay i will show you that so this is the carotid sheath okay so in the carotid sheath this is at the level of the uh, nasopharynx this i will discuss in little detail okay this is lateral pharyngeal process from where the nasopharyngeal pathway arises and today it is not our topic of discussion so i will discuss only on the medial the levator valve palatine muscle and tensor valve palatine muscle this is the levator valve palatine muscle and it arises one from the this one i have already told you that is from the petrous apex bone this is a petrous apex bone and then it arises from the carotid sheath can you see that this is a gives to carotid sheath and also from the medial cartilaginous part of the auditory this is the opening of the eustachian tube auditory tube eustachian tube so the muscle which is medial to the this is the eustachian tube medial to that is the levator valve palatine muscle lateral to that is the tensor valve palatine muscle this is the tensor valve palatine muscle and this is the levator valve palatine muscle okay then this tensor valve palatine muscle is also supplied by the medial nerve to medial pterygoid this is a medial pterygoid muscle and this is the lateral pterygoid muscle okay so this both arises from the lateral pterygoid plate and the tensor valve palatine muscle arises from the scaphoid fossa of the medial pterygoid plate so i think you are very clear now and both muscles are inserted into the palatine aponeurosis tensor valve palatine and levator valve palatine muscle and this is the area where you come across retropharyngeal nerves medial to the internal carotid artery okay now this is a palatine aponeurosis uh, this is the uh, origin of the tensor valve palatine and levator valve tensor valve palatine and levator valve palatine and it is getting attached to the the palatine aponeurosis you can see the tensor valve palatine is hooking around the pterygoid hamlet here to get attached to the palatine aponeurosis which is attached in the posterior aspect and the under surface of the heart palate now coming to the mri okay so if you, this is at the level of the nasopharynx okay then you may, you may ask me why you are discussing this mri because we are discussing oropharyngeal pathway i i want to show you how the the muscles which we discussed so this muscle this is the levator valve palatine muscle which arises from the petrous apex bone and also from the carotid sheath and also from the medial aspect of the auditory tube this is the levator valve palatine this is a tensor valve palatine Okay, this two muscles, and now this muscle is the this what is this is this muscle is the this is higher up. So you have to suspect a lateral pterygoid muscle because we will not come across a medial pterygoid. You can see medial pterygoid muscle, but the bulk of the medial pterygoid is 
not clearly seen here in this country. There's a medial pterygoid muscle, there's a lateral pterygoid muscle. This is a parapharyngeal space. Okay. And so tumor in the soft carrot can spread into the through this levator, levator vale palate muscle and tensor vale palate muscle into the lateral wall of the mesoderm. And when it arises, it becomes a T4 venesis. The pterygoid plate is destroyed, it becomes T4. And when the lateral pterygoid muscle is involved, then it also becomes T4. And that is how the you need to know the spread of the soft palate. And in the nasopharynx cut, you are not seeing any soft palate. Down that, this is the superior aspect of the Oropharynx, because when you start seeing the soft palate, this is the posterior part of the hard palate. So this is the soft palate. Okay. And in this cut, you can start seeing the superior constrictor muscle. This is superior constrictor muscle. In the rest, I'm not going in. This is the prevertebral muscles, like the pre. Yeah, this is how the prevertebral longus capitis muscle and longus collae muscle are seen, and how it looks in CT. This is longus capitis muscle. That's how you see in MRI. Okay, this is long as capitis muscle and this is long as colon. Now, soft palate tumors can spread superiorly into nasopharynx, anteriorly into heart palate. Then it becomes with a bone destruction, then it becomes T4. It can spread into the tonsil that we have discussed. And also, it can spread laterally into parapharyngeal space. And also, it can lead on to the, uh, this is the spread of the soft palate. And if you look into the, this is a, a tumor, which is a, is a patient present that the entire soft palate is involved both sides. And uvula is also involved. And lesion is extending into the both tonsillar process. So this is a lesion there. This is normal, this is not normal. This is the lesion. And you can see that in this material. This is the lesion involved in the soft palate. Now coming to the base of time. Now coming to the last part of my talk, I will uh, discuss. Uh, I will take another ten to fifteen minutes. Okay, I may be able to wind up by eight p.m. Then I will take a breakfast break. So the base of tongue, you need to know. It is very difficult to see radiologically to make out the posterior one third of the tongue because you can see the circumvallate papilla, but you cannot see that in a in a CT or MRI. So this is the posterior one third of the tongue. Okay, so then inferiorly it goes into the valvula and up to the it can spread into the lingual center of the epiglottis. First, I will discuss the base of tongue, then I will discuss valvula. So, if you have a base of tongue, so most important thing is that if you have a lesion in the base of tongue, it can spread anteriorly to the anterior front of the tongue. Inferiorly, it can spread into the what? Antero inferiorly it can spread into the chloroform. Inferiorly, it can spread into the pre epiglottis. And the hyoid, this is epiglottis, and there is a ligament called the hyoepiglottic ligament. Once this hyoepiglottic ligament is breached, it is infiltrated, it can involve the pre epiglottic space. This is pre epiglottic space. And anteriorly, it can spread into the, uh, the anterior to the tongue. And most of the tumors in the base of the tongue cross to the opposite side, and patient can have bilateral lymphadenopathy. And any patient is smoker and alcoholic, patient presents with bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy. Probably you think it is a metastatic node. If it is a hard node, always you palpate the posterior one of the tongue. You may be dealing with a lesion. And if you are not properly palpating this, even if you put a scope there or a, you will miss this, you may miss this area and you, you will immediately go into the larynx. You have to have a proper clinical examination of this area. So inferior, it can extend into the valicula and the pre-epiglottic space. Laterally, it can spread into the pterygomantula raphe. Then it can spread into the buccinator muscle. It can lead on to the mandible involvement, which I have discussed earlier. Posteriorly, it can lead on to the parapharyngeal space. Then it can in involve the carotid sheath. Superiorly, through the, the palatoglossus muscle, it can involve the top. Uh, just a word about the extrinsic muscles of the tongue because although it is not the topic today, but we need to know the, the infiltration of the base of tongue because it can extend into the floor of mouth and the anterior of the tongue. This is the, uh, the palatoglossus arises from the palate and aponeurosis getting inserted into the lateral aspect of the tongue. That is the palatoglossus muscle. The other muscle is the hyoglossus. This is the hyoglossus muscle. It arises from the, the entire area of the body of the hyoid bone and it is inserted into the tongue. The other muscle is the styloglossus muscle. This is the styloglossus muscle. Okay. 
then you have this is the style of process. Yes, you have the style of process. This is it. This is coming and getting stuck. Yeah, this is the style of process. Now the mother muscle is the genioglossus. So all the four, these are the genioglossus arise in the genian tubercle in the inner aspect of the man. And it is inserted into the tongue. So these are the muscles of the extrinsic muscle. One any lesion from an oropharynx infiltrating the extrinsic muscles of the tongue, then it becomes a T4 elements. And it is known as the sacroid. Now coming to the floor of mouth. The floor of mouth is formed by the geniohyoid muscle and mylohyoid muscle and the two belly of the digastro. Uh, okay, the, in this part we are now seeing the belly of the digastro. So this geniohyoid, mylohyoid muscle. So we, we will discuss that even the, the slum, this is called the sublingual space. Sublingual space, which involves the sublingual gland, it's dark, submandibular dark, and the lingual nerve. And these are the structures of the this uh, sublingual space. Okay, we need to know the, how the sublingual space will look like. This is the genioglossus space. Okay, so this is the genioglossus space. This is the genioglossus space. The lateral to that, you have the hyoglossus space. You have the hyoglossus space. So hyoglossus muscle is arising from the hyoid bone, getting inserted into the tongue. This is a hyoglossus. Okay. Then you have the mylohyoid muscle. This is a mylohyoid muscle. The mylohyoid muscle. Lateral to the mylohyoid muscle, you have the, this is the submandibular space. This is the submandibular space. So this is the spaces all will occur intensely enhanced in MRI. This is the space. Okay. This is the submandibular space. This is the submandibular space involving the submandibular gland. Okay, so this is the submandibular space. Now you have the, can you make out this enhancing area? This enhancing area, that is the sublingual space. This is the submandibular space, this is the sublingual space. Okay, genioglossus muscle, median raphe, you have the hyoglossus muscle, you have the mylohyoid muscle, and this is the extrinsic muscles which we can make out. Okay, styloglossus muscle, and uh, uh, it is it cannot be it can be seen but it is not clearly seen okay so these are the extrinsic muscles this is cut down okay this is again the hyoglossus muscle you have the mylohyoid muscle this is the genioglossus muscle this is the posterior one okay. and uh, um, you have the uh, this is the area little at the level of the floor now coming to the normal, which I have already discussed. This is a normal base of tongue, okay? And this is how you can, you can see an enhancing lesion. It is involving into the lingual subs of the epiglottis, then it becomes T3. And maybe, and uh, I'm not sure whether it is involving the epiglottis, but it is, I feel it is minimal. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, it seems the uh, few sentences in your, uh, few words in your sentences are not clear. Can you please uh, raise yeah. the volume? Speak yeah, yeah. Order. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. sorry, thank I'm you. sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is a T2 disease. Uh, you can, the, the this is the lingual surface of the epiglottis. This is the lingual surface of the epiglottis. And uh, it is not involved. Whereas the lingual surface of the epiglottis is involved. Once a base of tongue lesion involving the valicula and extending involving the lingual surface of the epiglottis, then it becomes a T3 disease. Whereas the lingual surface of the epiglottis is free, and then it becomes based on the size criteria. Okay. Then here, if they want the lingual surface the epiglottis is involved, then size criteria is immaterial. Even a two into two centimeter lesion can involve the lingual surface of the epiglottis. When, I do, when you are looking into the advanced disease, the major concern is whether the extrinsic muscles are involved or not. Suppose if you see this, the line of demarcation is it is not well demarcated, it is diffusely infiltrating like this then always you should be after the radiologist and look for whether the extrinsic muscles are involved because it, it will be automatically upstaged into a T4 disease. And moreover, here, the proper clinical examination is very important. The extent of anterior two third of the tongue is involved and it's involved and whether the lesion, the patient needs to one be submandible or gland need to be treated. Uh, many concerns are there. So uh, whether chemo need to be added. If it is initially, you thought it is a T2, if the extrinsic muscles are involved, then it becomes T4. You may have to intensify the T4. Coming to the valicular part, uh, so uh, this is at the level of the hyoid. This is the hyoid bone. This is the hyoid. 
exactly what you see in your CT scan because it is better seen, the valicular is better than mediate the valicular, the thyroid bone is better seen with CT scan. Okay, so the infrahyoid part, usually it is said that the suprahyoid part, the MRI is better than CT scan for oropharynx and nasopharynx. But for the infrahyoid part and for larynx and hypopharynx, CT may be a good choice and it may be good enough. So this is a hyoid bone. You have the valicular, this is the valicular, and both valicular are separated by median glossoepiglottic fold. This is the median glossoepiglottic fold. And you have the lateral pharyngeopiglottic fold. This is the lateral pharyngeal, or it is called the pharyngeopiglottic fold. The median glossoepiglottic fold, the pharyngeopiglottic fold. And this is the epiglottic. This is the inferior most cut of the uh, oropharynx. Below that is a pre epiglottic space, then it is like an larynx. So this is a valicular. Now we have the epiglottis here. This is the array epiglottic fold. The two, this is the array epiglottic fold. First to the array epiglottic fold, you have the pyriform sinus fold. I'm not going into the details because that's not our topic today. Now for here you have the, this is uh, how it will look like in a uh, MRI. This is the epiglottis, this is the epiglottic fold. This is the array epiglottic fold. This is a median glossopiglottic epiglottic fold. Valicular, this is a valicular. And you have the lateral pharyngeal epiglottic or the lateral pharyngeal epiglottic fold. And coming to the inferior most cut, this is the array epiglottic fold, array epiglottic fold. The pre-epiglottic fat, you have the hyoid bone, this is a black one. This is the hyoid bone. This is how it will look like in an MRI. In, it will be white in a CT scan, okay. So this is the hyoid bone, and the, this is the enhancing area, is spaced. So in, uh, in MRI, all spaces will enhance, and uh, the all the air cavities will be jet black. The muscles will be grayish. And so here you can see the bow. This is the last one. Coming to the base of tongue, this is the base of tongue lesion. Can you make out the lesion there? This is enhancing lesion in the base of tongue. And coming to the level of the valicula, and the lesion is coming down here. Uh, I'm not sure whether it, this is a lesion here. If you look, lesion is involving here. Lingual substance epiglottis is involved. Uh, we cannot clearly make out whether the pre epiglottic space is involved or not. So, most probably, I we may upstage into a T4M because if a pre epiglottic space is involved, then it becomes a T4M. Same is here, base of tongue lesion here, and when enhancing lesion there, the lesion is extending into the pre epiglottic space in the epiglottic, and it becomes a T4M. Last part that is the posterior pharyngeal wall. Okay, this is a posterior pharyngeal wall. The place corresponding to the oropharynx level is considered as the oropharynx. And you can see there, here the even if the preventable muscles are involved, it is not upstaged. Again, the size criteria applies, not like nasopharynx or in hypopharynx, it becomes T4B. In uh, nasopharynx, it becomes T2. Here it is not involved. And here the patient is also having a level two lymphoma. Now, this I have already mentioned in HPV positive disease. There is no uh, subclassification for T4. There is no T4A or T4B because the survival curves were hugging each other. So it's only T4. The T1 to T3 is same for HPV positive and HPV negative. The main difference lies in the nodal stage. The T4A and T4B that I have already discussed, when a base of tongue lesion extending into larynx it becomes T4. When a base of tongue lesion extra or the lesion in the tonsil going into base of tongue, then it involves the anterior two third of the tongue, extensive muscles involved, then it becomes T4. Medial pterygoid involvement, it becomes T4. Whereas lateral pterygoid involvement, it becomes T4P. Pterygoid plate destruction, T4P. Bone involvement from a, is hard palate, soft palate, with the bone destruction, it becomes T4. Mantible involvement, the bone involvement, here the bone involvement is T4, but pterygoid plate destruction it becomes T4. Cull base involvement, encasement of carota. Here you can see that this you can say this may be an isopharyngeal because from one cut you cannot make out. The plane with the prevertebral muscle is not maintained. The parapharyngeal, this is the parapharyngeal fat on right side, this is obliterated. Maybe an apathy of the medial pterygoid muscle is organized. For a nasopharyngeal custom, it's a classic feature of a T2 nasopharyngeal custom. But if the lesion is down, the main bulk is down, 
and it is it has gone into the lateral wall of the esophagus. It is it is a uh, T4B because the patient is having a lateral wall of the esophagus. So if you compare the oral cancer, oropharynx, like uh, the HPV negative, HPV positive, nasopharynx and maxilla, all put together, how the, the pterygoid muscle, so if you have a medial pterygoid muscle is involved, in oral cancer it becomes T4, because any masticator space involvement in an oral cancer is T4, whereas in oropharynx it is T4A. In HPV positive C oropharynx there is no subclassification. in nasopharynx it is only T4. Whereas in lateral pterygoid muscle, in oral cancer, it is T4B. Oropharynx is T4B. In HP positive C oropharynx, it is T4. In nasopharynx, it is T4. In lateral pterygoid muscle involvement is also a T2 in nasopharynx muscle. Whereas pterygoid plate involvement in oral cancer and oropharynx, it becomes T4B. And whereas in nasopharynx, bone involvement, it becomes only T2. In maxilla, pterygoid plate destruction is only T4A. It is not T4B. Now coming to the uh, retropharyngeal nodes, I will take another five minutes. Okay, then I will like that. Okay, the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, you, you, you have to look into the carotid sheath, medial to the internal carotid artery, you see the node, that is the retropharyngeal node. Usually you come across that. And if you have a HPV negative disease, this is for the first years, I know that few of them are junior residents. Okay, so um, uh, in N1, you have to look into three, four things. One, Single node, ipsilateral, less than or equal to three centimeter, and no signs of extra capsular expansion. That is HPV negative. Single node on one side, it becomes stage three disease. Then it becomes stage three. Whereas in HPV positive, even if you have multiple nodes on one side, if none of them are more than six centimeters, and if the primary is only T1 or T2, it can still be a stage one disease. That is N1 disease. Multiple nodes on one side, ipsilateral side, one side it is only N1. Even if the size is 5 in the it is only N1. And if it is T1 or a T2 primary, it is stage as stage 1. Whereas in a node, single node in HPV negative becomes stage 3. In HPV, in bilateral nodes, it becomes an N2 disease, an N2. And it is considered as a stage 2 disease. There is no subclassification for N2 in HPV positive C or HPV positive. Whereas N, this is N2C in HPV negative. And it is a stage 4 disease. So if you have this, you have a lesion in the posterior one side of the tongue, you have a lesion extending into the lateral uh, or lateral wall of the oropharynx involving the tonsil, also extending in the posterior pharyngeal wall with a node. If the T2N1, the stage 3 is HPV negative. Whereas, same situation, it will be stage 1 in a HPV possible. Okay, I will skip this. And if you have an N3 node, if you have an N3 node, in head and neck commercial customer, oral cavity, HPV negative, CO2, pharynx, larynx, and hypopharynx. N3 beams, it becomes a stage 4B. There is N3A and N3B. In N3 is not subclassified in HPV positive CO2, pharynx. It becomes a stage 3 disease. Because T4 or N3 is stage 3. Nasopharynx, it becomes stage 4A. N3 disease in nasopharynx, it becomes stage 4 So I have, uh, I have this, we have discussed already. I'm not going into the details. Okay, so uh, I have two cases for you because uh, we have been listening for almost one hour. A 62-year-old gentleman presents with a soft palate with extension into heart palate, causing destruction in CT scan. The soft palate extending into heart palate, bone destruction, so it becomes T4. If the P16 positive, it becomes T4. There is no T4A or T4B. It becomes T4. And patient also have multiple nodes on ipsilateral side. Maximum size is 2 into 2. That is only N1. It is a T4A N1. So it becomes a stage 3 disease. Because T4 or N3, it becomes a stage 3. Coming to the, this is a homework for you because tomorrow we will discuss the management. I'm winding up. There's a 52 year old gentleman presents with a tonsil. Uh, this is a, a left lateral tonsil, left uh, tonsil is one extending into the basal tongue with two nodes, T16 positive. So it is a T2. Two nodes are there. So it becomes multiple nodes on one side, it becomes only N1. So it's a T2 N1. What is the stage? The stage one. How will you treat this patient? Concurrent chemoradiation, radical radiotherapy or radiotherapy plus cephex map, or the, what, what's the treatment? That we will discuss tomorrow. Okay. So this I will skip. 
Okay, because this is the case for tomorrow. So uh, I, I dedicate this lecture to my teacher, uh, Professor Ramtas. Uh, he's currently the head of the Department of Radiation Oncology at our institution. And next week, uh, this week, he is taking all into retirement. So I take uh, this lecture to him. Thank you very much for your patience. I'm happy to take the question. Thank you so much, sir. It was a very clear and comprehensive outlook over on anatomy of such a complex topology uh, site. Uh, sir, some of the questions in the chat box. Uh, can you please brief on CT simulation imaging protocols for uh, radiation planning in CO referring? What is followed in your center and what do you recommend? Uh, okay, that we will take tomorrow because tomorrow we'll stick on to this. To, I have not discussed anything about the uh, CT simulation or anything. So we will take up that question tomorrow. Okay, sure, sir. And another question on the same vein: Can you comment on MR-based planning? Which cases is MRI used for delineation, and which sequences are okay? Used? So tomorrow we'll take up the contouring part, uh, the contouring. So uh, the any uh, diagnostic imaging, any staging uh, investigations today we will take up. The, the this we can re reserve all these questions for tomorrow. Okay. So I, okay. I'll be very grateful if you can copy this and send me uh, as an email. Then I will go through that. Then I will I will give all the answers tomorrow because tomorrow will be the day for the, the target volume delineation. Okay. okay, sure, sir. A uh, few of the other questions: uh, Is MRI routinely done for head and neck patient for staging in ACC Ventrum? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, if a patient is planned for an IGRT, definitely it may be better to have an MRI because uh, proper clinical examination and MR that if possible to have a fusion, it will be better than having a CT alone taken during CT simulation. So it may be better to have an MR, especially in patients who have a soft palate involvement or a base of tongue involvement. It may be better to have a MR. Okay, then, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, sir, one question, is there need for biopsy from primary if a nodal biopsy is already available? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, if you have uh, uh, the main concern, uh, the questions are one, you suspect uh, there are two clinical scenarios I will give you. If you a patient is having a suspect of a P16 disease, so in that situation, do you you, uh, you have a very small primary? Most of the time, this will have a small primary. So, do you will be happy with taking a coronal biopsy from the node? Okay, that will be more than enough. In this classic teaching, is that if you can take a biopsy from the primary side, that is more desirable. If you have a P16 negative disease, that's the most common clinical scenario in our situation. So it may be better to have a biopsy from the primary side. But if you have a, if you, the patient had undergone an FNAC from outside and you have a frank lesion there, and if you, if you are not expecting, if you are not planning to do, or if you are not doing a P16 assay, that's fine. But if from FNAC, then the pathologist may not be comfortable in doing an uh, IHC for, for the P16. So it may be better to have a biopsy if you are planning for a, a P16 assay. Otherwise, if you are not planning for P16 assay, okay, then I feel that FNAC is good enough. Then in that situation, biopsy may not be mandated. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, one question uh, regarding uh, target volume selection, uh, which node will be taken in intermediate dose levels in differing P status? Okay, so that is the, that is the topic for tomorrow. Okay, yes. Sir. yes. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, uh, one more. If primary disease involves part of fat space or muscle, should we control the whole muscle or space? Again, I think this will be our yeah, topic yeah, for yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Now, can you can you do me a, a favor? Okay. Uh, 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 I think uh, um, so. Please, uh, please do. Please copy this and send me as an email. Then all the contouring questions I will take up tomorrow. Sure, sir. So, uh, request to all participants, uh, please put up your delineation queries in the WhatsApp groups. We'll compile everything and send to sir and one uh, set of questions and sir will be answering all the delineation yeah, yeah. related queries tomorrow. Um, uh, the role of, elaborate the role of PET in imaging. Okay. In the routine PET imaging, uh, it is not recommended. If you, if you, it is a category 2B recommendation. So, if you, is it mandatory to do have a PET CT or for all oropharyngeal carcinoma? No. Uh, it is not required, okay, uh, uh, because it may be an unnecessary exercise. Will you do a uh, 
will you incorporate a pet ct uh, on your contouring part that we will take up tomorrow for staging purpose pet ct is not mandated it is not required okay unless there is compelling suppose if this is required as a part of metastatic workup if you have a node and the endoscopy shows no disease from nasopharynx oropharynx larynx and hypopharynx then as part of that then you may pick up a, a lesion in the oropharynx then in that situation you will do a uh, uh, pet scan otherwise if a prang lesion presenting in the base of tongue or the tonsil or in the soft palate you will not do a pet ct as part of work of distant metastatic work up. i think many questions are from the uh, uh, many questions are from the um, uh, for regarding the contouring part okay so join me tomorrow so i will take up all these questions okay thank you so much sir i think most of us can't wait to learn the implementation of today's class in tomorrow's session uh, we would like to thank everyone for joining today's session please join the webinar tomorrow the same recurring zoom meeting will apply yeah same time tomorrow the same meeting id and password uh, it is also being broadcast on youtube in case we exceed our uh, number of uh, capacity of participants you can join on youtube live too okay if uh, no further queries we can end the session sir sure sure good night thank okay. you very much thank you everyone for joining good night